Thanks, Sherry. Oh, that's Can everyone see the, the upcycling food title slide there? Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, I will go ahead and get started. So kia ora, kia ora kata, um, and thank you for the invitation to come along and, and speak to you this morning. You'll be aware that, that massive amounts of food, and we're talking a third of all food, at least a third of all food, um, that is currently produced is, is lost or wasted between uh, farm and fork. And I just want to start off by making this morning by making the point that this reducing food waste matters. And in fact, it really, really matters. You know, globally, we are losing US $1 trillion of food uh, that is wasted. And of, you know, it's obviously got huge environmental and, and social consequences. And you know, just of interest to this group, I think, uh, for example, it's, it's estimated that uh, eight to 10% of all human caused greenhouse gas emissions come from food waste, um, which is why actually reducing food waste is, is considered to be one of the, the greatest solutions to climate change. So to address this issue, we uh, have governments, we've got organizations and companies from around the world that are rallying behind SDG 12.3, which is to reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. Uh, and in New Zealand, we have our own group of, of food waste champions uh, that consist of representatives from across that supply chain, New Zealand's food supply chain, who are committed to this goal. And, and I co-chair this group and another Dunedin Knight you might recognize there in the photo is, is Deborah Manning, who is of course the, the rock star of the New Zealand food rescue world. Um, and there's a heap of really exciting food waste reduction uh, work happening in New Zealand at the moment by lots of different stakeholders at lots of different levels, also parts of that supply chain. And, and anyone that's really sort of interested in, in learning more about what's happening, I'm, I'm always open for a, for a coffee. Um, so, so please hit me up and, and let's do that. Um, in the first instance, you can hop on to the Champions 12.3 website and have a look at this um, reduction roadmap, which we released last year. It really showcases the work of our Champions organizations in this food waste reduction space. Uh, in conjunction with the university, the Champions Group undertook a research project uh, where we mapped out the solutions um, to food waste reduction. Uh, we interviewed uh, 40 or so representatives from across the food supply chain in New Zealand to identify opportunities uh, within each of these different stages of the supply chain. Uh, and we present those opportunities in this report. So under each of uh, supply, uh, supply chain stage, there are recommendations for government, there are recommendations for businesses and for consumers. Uh, we've also just written a manuscript which draws from this data that identifies what we call a, a, a range of critical success factors uh, for successful food waste reduction practices. Uh, again, if you're interested, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. What I want to focus on today specifically is, is one stage, it's looking at the processing stage uh, or the food manufacturing um, sector, so to speak. So taking food waste reduction actions in this in this sector is really a win-win proposition for food manufacturers. It, it obviously makes businesses, uh, you know, reducing food waste makes businesses more sustainable, it boosts their profits, it builds shareholders' confidence in the, in the company, and really highlights to consumers the, um, the, the company's commitment to sustainability. So there's lots of actions that food manufacturers can take to reduce waste. Um, I've just got a few up here on this slide, you know, consumer education. Um, so you, you, through tips and messages that are printed on packaging, for example, on how to store your food once you get it home, um, you know, in the fridge, in the freezer, et cetera. Uh, manufacturers can look at repackaging products in a range of different portion sizes um, using resealable packaging or um, also considering there's a, a range of innovative packaging solutions now in the sort of active packaging space that can help extend the shelf life of, of products and et cetera. Um, date labeling has been shown to be quite confusing to consumers. So looking at uh, simplifying best before use by, you know, sell by dates uh, can be another, another initiative that businesses can take. Uh, there is, uh, um, uh, software solutions that, that companies can take uh, to help optimize their supply chain so products reach store more quickly. 
Um, one thing we saw over COVID was that it was really useful when uh, manufacturers were able to build in flexibility into their system, particularly in their packaging um, of, the, of the products. So they could change from out of home, sort of large uh, food service size packs to smaller retail consumer ready packaging and, and so forth. So one of the one of the things that we're working on at the moment, um, and I am going to get to upcycling very very shortly, I promise. But just just before I do so, one of the things we're working on with our champions group at the moment that I just wanted to mention uh, is a voluntary agreement uh, with key businesses in New Zealand's food sector uh, to reduce their food waste through what we what, what is uh, internationally best known as uh, internationally known as the best practice approach, which is a, a target measure act approach. Uh, so these sorts of voluntary agreements have been used overseas uh, successfully in a number of countries and, and in that sort of manufacturing and, and retailing sector. And they've been used at scale to so a lot of businesses. Uh, and they have, like I said, been really quite successful in reducing food waste in, this, in these sectors. So here in New Zealand, uh, we're just in the design stage at the moment. Um, we have a number of initial signatories on board uh, and we're, we're really sort of working out exactly what this commitment will look like. Um, we've just had the Ministry for the Environment uh, come on board financially and, and support this initiative uh, for the next few years. Uh, and we're going to be formally launching this in with a bit of a hoo-ha um, up at Fonterra in November. Uh, so we're super excited to see where, where this um, agreement, I guess, lands and where we, you know, where we, where we go with this. So it's a, just to watch this space. Okay, I promised I was going to get on to upcycling. Here we are. Um, it's a, a food waste prevention action that is gaining lots of momentum. Um, upcycling foods, are, they're basically, they're made from ingredients that would have otherwise ended up in a food waste destination. So they're really value add products. Um, there was a, a team of, of experts from Harvard Law School and et cetera that have, have defined um, upcycling, which is, is up there on the slide. And I guess this was, was done for um, sort of policy and, and research use. So there was a consistent uh, definition of what these foods are. So it's upcycling is a, is a really a, quite an innovative approach to food waste because it's really the first consumer product based solution. Um, which does make it a food waste prevention action, which is quite scalable uh, and, of course, makes it economically sustainable. So it's not surprising that, that businesses are you know, really excited about, about these foods. And um, it's estimated there's over 400 products already in the US marketplace alone. Um, you know, here on the slide, according to the, this company, um, the AI company Spoonshoot, um, interest grew in 128% um, in the business media across the past past year. Like I said, there's this commercial benefits to reducing waste and so no surprise there. Um, the, there was a report put out in 2019 uh, by Future Market, which revealed that the sector was is worth 46.7 billion. It says, so, you know, with an expected compound annual growth rate of 5% over the over the next 10 years. Um, yeah, so it really is a trend that is, is, is defining the industry I've got here. It's, it's catching on. We're seeing big players, you know, Food Network magazine, Whole Foods, really influential in, in sort of shaping and, and setting trends, talking about this listing upcycled foods as a top trend uh, last year and, and this year, and, and lots of others are too. There's a lot of a lot of talk about these foods. Just an example of what I'm talking about with a you know an upcycled food. Uh, this is a, a, a one here on the on the, called Kapal. Um, it's a, a snack food, obviously. It was listed by um, as one of the 20th healthiest new snacks on the market in this Men's Health magazine. So what this does, it's it, this this product is it combines oat and puffed quinoa uh, with parts of that cacao fruit, which they traditionally discard once they um, extract that cacao bean uh, for chocolate production. So that's incorporated in. That's the upcycled component, obviously. Um, which, which then sort of qualifies as a, an upcycled food. Um, and in the US, you know, we're, particularly we're seeing this massive, uh, I guess, an upswell of, of adoption and promotion of these foods by major retailers. I don't know if you're familiar with this one here, Mum, it's an organic market, a chain of, of organic um, stores. And they've got about 20 or so stores on, on the East Coast of America there. 
um, and they've actually got these dedicated end caps um, in store and you know which which uh, exclusively for these upcycled products um, actually in the store where this photo was taken uh, there was spillover upcycled products you know, on, the, on the shelf as well as of uh, just, just recently, you can now buy upcycled foods that have these labels on it. So it's a certification label, I guess. And it's a, it's a standard that identifies um, authentic upcycled foods. Uh, and it's, it's been launched by the Upcycled Food Association. So it's the first, the world's first third party certification program uh, for upcycled food ingredients and, and products. And as well as certification, the association supports businesses um, through a upcycled digital marketing toolkit, uh, which is all sort of provides, um, what do you call it, like boilerplate material, um, talking point assets. And, and it's a terms of, I guess, a handy terms of reference for companies to help clearly explain to consumers what they've done um, to provide transparency around that raw upcycled ingredient uh, to, to their um, yeah, to the consumer market, obviously, as well as their stakeholders. So internationally, there's a real buzz around upcycling at the moment. I just want to pause and take a, um, a moment to say, and, and to make the point, I guess, uh, that upcycling alone is, is not going to save the world. And that's a very obvious point to make. Uh, but I do want to, to, to say that it is incredibly important that we prioritize food waste reduction efforts. You know, according to the, you, you may be familiar with the food waste hierarchy, uh, with the top of that, the most important thing we need to, to, uh, to do is to prevent food waste happening in the first place. And um, this was a, a, an article, it was a terrible article, actually. it was in the ODT um, last year, I think it was, uh, where, where I say just this, that you know, sexy upcycling uh, isn't, isn't going to solve New Zealand's food waste problem. Um, but I do think, you know, where upcycling has an important role to play is in making use of what we call unavoidable food waste. So this is waste that was inherently inedible. Uh, you know, I mentioned the, the cacao husk, uh, things like, again, coffee husks, uh, spent grain from the manufacturing process, um, foods that would not have otherwise been eaten. Um, and, you know, despite, uh, you know, upcycling, uh, not, not going to say, you know, not, not the solution, the solution that's going to, to solve the food waste crises, it is being considered uh, by food waste advocates internationally as a, um, I guess, a serious weapon in, in our war on waste. All right, so what is happening here at home? In New Zealand, we've got organizations like the Bioresource Processing Alliance, Callaghan, uh, Venture Timaru, Sustainable is Attainable, um, and they're working to support R&D in, in this uh, upcycling space. We've only really got a handful of commercially available product on market here in New Zealand. I don't know if you're familiar with any of these brands. Um, Rutherford and, and Mayer have a upcycled grain cracker or a range actually of upcycled grain crackers. Uh, we've got a couple of pet food um, companies that are that have startup Deja and, and Perfect Deli uh, fresh dog rolls. So they use unwanted um, deli, deli and butchery meats from retailers, for example, um, and, and turn those into dog foods. Perhaps the best known uh, product is or company is, is Citizens Collective. Uh, their brewers make surplus bread. Uh, to so they, they collect the surplus bread to make its ferments. They then actually have a nice little circular story because they then put the the beer byproduct, that spent grain, and take that and, and uh, bake a bread from that. Um, so they've also recently got a, a spritz there that they've uh, made by repressing the um, the wine grape um, or the wine making grape pomace as, as well. In uh, the uh, um, in the, the fast food space, this burger launched, I think it was only last week, um, it's at the, I think it's Burger, burger Fuel, the chain Burger Fuel, uh, it's an, an upcycled burger and an upcycled Coke, so it's got a, um, a, a burger which is actually made from a Fjordland um, a venison patty, so it comes from, um, they, they, when they, Every, every year, obviously, there's, there's wild deer, um, which are introduced, which are um, 
culled and and what they do is they they take that meat and and turn it into a patty and I think they give a dollar from uh, every burger is donated back to support the park's uh, conservation efforts as well it's got a, a rescued central Otago cherry sauce it's got rescued wonky car uh, carrots from from Pukekohe it's got a rescued bun which is made with four percent spent grain flour um, and a rescued cherry cola as well. So just to show, you know, just to, that these products are also um, sort of spilling into that, that fast food sector as well. Uh, locally, we've got a Dunedin craft distillers uh, where you can buy botanical spirits. There's a Dunedin dry gin and a, and a cacao vodka, uh, which again is made from surplus bread and, and bakery products. And actually the founders are both ex-University of Otago staff. Some of you will no doubt uh, know, know them. And they've written about their journey in their online distillers diary. Um, which starts off with a post that makes reference to, to some of the research we did uh, quantifying food waste in the retail, uh, bread waste in particular in the retail sector a number of years ago. Um, so it's, it, was, it was awesome to see this research as being you know, used in the, in the war of waste and, and especially, I guess, uh, by one of the, um, you know, a, a creative startup like, like this one. So there's another group working in the space, which is our own group. Uh, this is the University of Otago Food Waste Innovation Research Theme. Uh, as a research theme, we, we launched in 2020. Uh, our goal is to harness the best scientific expertise uh, to provide effective solutions to Aotearoa's food waste problems. Uh, we've got, I'm joined on the steering committee with Professor Phil Bremer, who's from Food Science, and Professor um, Sheila Ski from Human Nutrition. Um, we are, we've got three sub themes. We've got a theme looking at social innovations. Uh, so it's around sort of using behavioral science to understand drivers responsible for waste and in order to be able to make recommendations um, on minimization initiatives. Uh, we've got a theme on technical innovations, which is all around sort of using the latest science and technology to provide food waste solutions. Uh, and then we've got a theme looking at the metrics of, of waste, uh, measuring, understanding how much food is being wasted, where it's being wasted, and the um, social, environmental, and, and economic impacts of that waste. Uh, we also have a dedicated upcycled food lab, uh, which we've got a range of projects running, running through, which I'm going to, to highlight in a moment. Before I do that, I just wanted to put a plug in for an event that's happening tomorrow night. Uh, this is uh, our, our research theme is hosting uh, the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, uh, Dame Julia Girard, and, and her office in Dunedin um, over the next couple of days. Uh, we've got a series of events organised, uh, including a public uh, discussion, a public panel discussion tomorrow evening in the, in the School of Commerce, uh, starting at 5.30. Uh, we are going to have some of our researchers, our theme researchers, uh, talking with some of our champions, New Zealand food waste champions who are also joining us in Dunedin um, about um, this topic here about you know, envisaging an Aotearoa without food waste. Uh, we are planning on providing a whole lot of our upcycled food products that our clever students and had, have, been, have been working on um, as nibbles at the event. So um, we do ask if you would like to come and that you register, uh, but if you haven't registered and you'd like to come, just, just come along anyway, it should be a good evening. All right, um, just in terms of what we're doing with our upcycled food lab, uh, last year we had a, a team of food scientists led by my colleague Graham Ears, who's up here on the on the slide, uh, and coordinated by PhD Grace Clear, who's who's online with us right now. Uh, they set out to explore the maximum amount of bread that could be substituted into a good tasting beer. Um, obviously, the concept is a innovative way to divert some of the 29 million loaves of bread. Uh, which are wasted annually in New Zealand. Uh, and if you didn't know, bread, bread is New Zealand's most number one uh, wasted food product at the household, uh, actually in the retail and at the household level. So we, you know, 29 million loaves of bread. Uh, it's, it's a lot of bread. Uh, so uh, we, this, this team here worked with Citizens Collective, who I mentioned earlier, um, and, and basically, basically did a, a series of product development trials uh, and, and looked at increasing the amount of bread, wasted bread that was able to get into each, each bottle of beer. Uh, what they did um, for fun was to put a how-to guide for home brewers together. Uh, so it develops 50% of the malt, it substitutes 50% of the malt uh, that you would usually um, use in the beer making process with the bread. 
Uh, so using this recipe is almost five slices of bread, uh, which can go into each bottle of beer uh, per 500 ml bottle of beer. So if you'd like to have a go at doing this at home, there's a, an infographic on our Food Waste Innovation uh, website. You can have a look at that um, and, and work your way through that. There's also a ginger beer uh, recipe and, and um, tutorial if you're, if you're interested in that. Again, in the spirit of not wasting anything, uh, they made a vegan chocolate cake with the spent grain from that process. And there's a little video tutorial um, again on our website if you'd like to have a go. We've got a bunch of students that are cooking up a, an upcycled storm in our lab um, with some really neat products. Just a couple of examples here. These were um, uh, some students last year who co-founded a, a startup called Reshined Roots. It's, it's using upcycled um, ugly sort of wonky you know, tier two or three carrots that don't, don't make it uh, into, into the retailers. Um, carrot bins and turning those into these crispy snacks. And this, these, this trio actually went through the Audacious program, which the School of Commerce um, the, the run each year. Um, and uh, that program, if you're not familiar with it, it basically helps facilitate uh, the process of turning the ideas of young entrepreneurs uh, into, into reality. So we're very much, we're going to be serving some of their crackers tomorrow night, uh, but also look forward to seeing their products on supermarket shelves soon, we hope. Uh, this was a slightly different project. Again, these are third year students. Um, we worked with the New Zealand Food <coughs> Network for this project. New Zealand uh, Food Network, if you're not familiar with that, is an organization, it's a non-for-profit that distributes bulk surplus food, um, from uh, you know, from from growers, for example, um, so you know, tons of tomatoes that might be supplied by turners and growers, and it, it distributes those around uh, to to food hubs and then further out to, to food rescue organisations to help feed uh, New Zealand's food insecure. Mm. So one of the challenges that this um, network faces is how to distribute. Well, they, I guess they get these sort of gluts of I've mentioned, you know, tons of tomatoes. Uh, which obviously have a, a, um, a short shelf life uh, and, and need to be, you know, distributed all across the country. So this team was tasked with making a, a shelf stable product um, and that was able to be passed out through these networks. And so they developed a, a, a tomato paste and some apple crisps. And what they did was develop them in such a way that the, the process was really simple. So the concepts can actually be used, um, upscaled and, and used using just sort of general processing machinery, which most manufacturers, um, you know, you can find in most manufacturing facilities. Um, and it, yeah, obviously created a, a non-refrigerated shelf stable product um, while reducing the volume for, for food banks, which allowed more storage um, in, their, you know, in their facilities and so forth. So the network was really, really happy with the, the product here. Uh, this is another one, one of my colleagues, um, Pat Silcock, and he's been, he actually runs uh, the Food Science Department's um, Commercial New Product Development Centre. Uh, he's currently working on an unmagic syrup made from bread waste for use in the manufacturing sector. It's going to have a, a dizzying array of applications. Um, I guess, you know, with these products, it's, we're doing more than making products. Uh, where the work is adding value is really in the science behind these creations. So, you know, while there are companies already, commercial companies like Citizens um, Collective that I've just mentioned that are already, you know, developing adequate beers using stale bread, uh, what our scientists are doing is exploring how to optimize the initial processing conditions for the stale bread in terms of time temperature, um, enzymes, uh, you know, enzyme concentrations in order to maximize that conversion of the degre degraded um, starch and bread to fermentable sugars um, and then by developing this, this bread waste you know, sugar solution that can be range, used in, in a range of other products. Um, likewise, the, the research is looking at things on, on ways to upcycle bread flour. Um, it's, it's, again, thing, the science here is it's focusing on obtaining a, a fundamental understanding of this new raw material um, so that we can better predict its functionality uh, and what additives or, or sort of different processing steps are going to be required uh, so that it can be used as a, a viable replacement for, for standard non-upcycled flour. Uh, we've got an honours student this year, Brian, Brian Thong in food science, who is uh, working with the upcycled food company Rescued Kitchen. Um, 
and, and, and I guess in the absence of a, a fundamental understanding of the in inherent properties of the raw material, you know, processes are having to rely on a, a trial and error approach uh, when they're working with something like upcycled, upcycled flour. Um, and that relies on the, you know, the experience and the expertise of the operator again. So that so the team here is, is working on uh, providing that, that base understanding uh, that can then be used by, you know, up, used by industry uh, to, to make this an easier, easier process for all. All right, so as well as some of these innovations in the lab that have you know, just been running through, one of the things our upcycled team have been really, um, yeah, we, we've been busy on other fronts as well. And we've, we've run a series of uh, public engagement type events to help educate the public on the benefits associated with upcycled food. And what I've got here on the slides, just a couple of photos from an event we ran in collaboration with Everybody Eats um, as part of the International Science Festival last year. Um, we developed, uh, I don't know if you know Everybody Eats or not, it's a, a social enterprise that takes wasted food uh, and works with top chefs to turn it into three course meals. And it's a pay as you feel dining concept. So you pay a lot if you can and you pay nothing if you can't. Uh, they've got uh, restaurants in Auckland and Wellington. So we, we hosted them down here and we, we ran a pay as you feel type uh, dining event where we, we um, the food was provided by Kiwi Harvest, which is a food rescue organization here in New Zealand. And we also provided um, a number of our upcycled food products and and throughout the evening we had some of our our team talking about you know food waste and and the science behind some of the upcycled products that that were sampling so it was a really fun event it's not just the public that we need to educate around um, upcycling and the benefits of upcycling it's also the food industry as well and and upcycling um you know, I guess in, in retailers as well. Uh, one of the products we've done recently was to conduct interviews with the category managers at supermarkets to understand their perceptions of ranging upcycling foods in their stores. And, and we tried to really unpick the uh, decision-making processes which influence uh, whether these new products would be ranged or not. Uh, and you know, this is really useful because uh, the category managers and the, and the big retailers, you know, we've only got a couple of big retailers, as you'll be aware in New Zealand, they're really the gatekeepers to, re, uh, to, to retail shelves, um, you know, so if they like something, it will be ranged, and if they don't, it, it won't. So uh, what we were able to obtain with this research was, uh, I guess, to provide some insights into the barriers and opportunities for suppliers and manufacturers of upcycled foods. So, um, what we did with this, uh, like we do with most of the research we're producing in the lab, is that we try and produce a, a user-friendly resource. In this case, it was a resource targeting food manufacturers. Uh, and we put that up on our website. Um, and we've, we've got a, a resource hub there. Uh, so this particular resource provides recommendations to upcycled food, uh, want to be manufacturers and, and suppliers to help improve their engagement with, with retail product category managers. Of course, we can provide the best innovative products. Um, we can even convince retailers to stock them. You know, but ultimately, the the success of this uh, sector will depend on consumer acceptability of these new products. You know, will they buy them? Will they buy them again? Uh, so, what I want to do is just to shift the the focus of the presentation just for a few moments uh, into the consumer insights uh, space and. Here on the slide, I've got a, um, some results from a, a Coleman Brunton, a market research company, a survey which showed that 70% of New Zealand is searching for sustainable choices. 67% of those want to make environmentally conscious decisions, even at a, a greater cost. However, until recently, there was no data in New Zealand uh, on New Zealand's um, New Zealanders sort of perceptions or attitudes towards these, this, this new category, essentially, of, of food, of upcycled food. Uh, so we've run a series of studies now which have been in the sort of consumer insights space and I'm just going to talk you quickly through a couple of um, results uh, from some of those studies. So we started this work in 2019. Uh, we, we started with a, a, had a couple of um, consumer food science students, honours students uh, do this work. It was a series of four focus groups and a, a nationwide survey of a thousand consumers um, that was nationally representative on, on the usual things. Um, the, 
both the both the survey and the focus groups were actually designed to be more exploratory rather than confirmatory in nature and i think we did this you know given the concept of upcycling foods was um it was particularly in 2019 still very novel uh you know there was little research that had been done previously uh so so we took that more sort of exploratory approach um both the survey and the focus groups int introduced the product concept uh, we're using bread as an example, and I've got a little picture there on the slide. Um, but it was it was basically the description explained the process of upcycling supermarket waste. Um, so where the bread on the shelf was sort of reaching the end of its its shelf life, but or didn't sell, uh, sent back to collected, sent back to the processing facility, where it was then turned into a slurry and, and turned into a new product, which is then sold back to the supermarket. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier why we used bread. Um, it was also uh, a, we had a sponsoring company for this uh, who were interested in, uh, one of New Zealand's large manufacturers who were interested in the feasibility of, um, you know, doing just this. So when we uh, are looking at consumer research, understanding consumers' initial reaction uh, is really critical in understanding product concept testing, um, oh sorry, in, in product um, concept testing. It gives us a really good indicator of whether a particular product is going to stand out or not in a market. And, and you can see, we probably can't, so it's really small. Um, what it says here on this slide is the majority of consumers initial reaction to this concept of upcycled foods was, was positive um and uh, yeah there was the if you can't see there was 63 percent uh who's um who, who was positive and the largest proportion of consumers 39 percent had a somewhat positive initial reaction um respondents viewed upcycling as unique uh with 80% of consumers thinking it was different or very different to other, other concepts that were available to them, um, which again, these responses indicate that the proposed concept is, is different enough from existing um, product ranges or solutions to be marketed as, as novel. They saw it as exciting, they saw it as being environmentally friendly. Um, just some, some of the qualitative uh, quotes that came through here. This is a word cloud and yeah, you know how these work, the, the larger the, the font, the more frequent the word was mentioned. Um, there was um, yeah, some of the most frequent words that, when, that people um, uh, gave us when, when asked about what they liked most about the concept were things like obviously reduced wastage, uh, we saw it as a form of recycling, it was good for the environment, you know, food out of landfill, and they liked the new, new aspect and the sort of fun aspect, novel aspect uh, about that. And you can, you can see that um, in some of those quotes there on the right. When we asked them what they liked least about the concept, um, again, they, they were concerned about contamination. You know, these are essentially waste products. Is it safe? Is it going to be safe for me to eat? Um, that's where the words afraid, you know, come in. Um, maybe cheap products, you know, it's a waste product. It's, it's, it's of little value. Um, there were some interesting quotes that came through in terms of, oh, well, if we are taking the bread, uh, you know, that's currently being distributed to food rescue and to food insecure, um, you know, how is that going to impact on, on those, you know, on, on that process and, and will this, you know, put those, those organizations out of business, so to speak. Um, it was overwhelming consensus uh, in, uh, among the consumers that they needed to be made aware of the process. They've got companies that are upcycling have to be transparent about this. Um, I've mentioned the concern around safety and hygiene of the products. And so, you know, for this reason, I think it's really important that companies, if they are interested in playing in this space, um, full of ingredient disclosure, they need assurances, maybe independent certifications, like the one that I mentioned earlier, that, that new upcycled certification, uh, you know, that's really going to be key in providing uh, consumers their reassurance that, that these products are not only safe, but you know, have a, a positive environmental uh, benefit as well. I'm just going to skip through a couple of slides here. Um, 
in addition to the individual factors that I, I've just been talking about, there were some other factors that, that um, helped to determine whether, you know, um, acceptance, I guess, which I just want to mention quickly. Uh, there was a, a preference for the product to be disconnected for the raw material. So if it was um, coming from bread, for example, to not be turned into another loaf of bread, but actually be turned into a different product category or a different product in a different category uh, and not sold next to the original. If it was, um, you know, a bread into bread, they're not selling it right next to the, the fresh or the original product, which was interesting. Um, it was important that there was product congruency if it was an upcycled product and it was obviously promoting the environmental benefits of reducing food waste then obviously should have some some you know use sustainable packaging uh look at things like carbon footprint and things so the need to be consistent just just having an upcycled ingredient wasn't enough to to resonate with with new zealand consumers these sorts of products were perceived as having higher other benefits. Um, so people would be interested in buying them because of that social and environmental good, rather than a, a sort of an individual benefit, like a health benefit, which, which makes some sense. Uh, you know, because it is a bit of a, uh, because of the fact that they are coming, products coming from waste streams, you know, marketers are going to have to be careful with terminology and the types of messaging that they're using uh, to, to make sure that they, you know, they, yeah, to make sure that they resonate well with, with the target audience. Uh, and, and one of the things that really interested people in these products, like I mentioned early on, was the novelty point. Um, and so that's, a, you know, at least in the early stages, uh, is, is a, um, a selling point for these, you know, for these types of foods. Um, since that's that, that sort of initial work, we've carried on with, with this work. We've run a number of studies since then. Um, in this study here, which was 2020, upcycled foods had just started appearing on New Zealand supermarket shelves. Like I mentioned, there's still not many, but there was a little bit more familiarity about what these, these, these foods were. Um, this was a, a survey of a thousand uh, foodstuffs shoppers. Um, one of the things, and I won't go into the study, I'm, I'm running out of time quickly, but I just wanted to mention one of the things we've done with, with uh, Many of, our, many of our studies uh, is that we've created, I, I mentioned earlier, this resource hub on our food waste innovation website. Um, and so we're really trying to make the research accessible to, to the different stakeholders and to the general public. And so in addition to, to publishing, you know, the, the academic paper that we're expected to do, we also provide um, talking abstracts where we interview the, uh, the key author for the study and ask them, you know, to, to explain the research in a really easily digestible way. Um, so if you want to more, you know, to learn more about this study, for example, you can jump on and, and hear the interview with lead author Francesca Goodman-Smith. Um, so yeah, have a, have a look at that if you're interested. I'm, I'm actually just going to skip this one here, um, but what I want to just, the, the, the point I just want to make quickly before I move on is that yeah, across these studies that we've done, um, they overwhelming evidence is, is indicating that there is sufficient demand in New Zealand, sufficient consumer demand in New Zealand to consider this, this um, upcycling, an idea that is, you know, has got exciting market potential and, and that we are likely to see growth in this area, adoption of these products and growth in this, in this area once the manufacturer sector, you know, starts to, to, to put um, product in, in shelf. Now there's a willing, I guess, we, we've sort of demonstrated a willing market for these products. What we're doing, uh, where we're sort of shifted with our research at the moment this year is, is we're starting to look at, okay, if we're going to, to put these products, how do we out? How do we start to package and promote them? Um, and so this year we're looking at the, the different ways of um, framing the benefits of upcycling uh, to understand whether the manufacturers should emphasize the health aspects, um, the, the environmental aspects or the economic aspects um, or benefits, I guess, of, of upcycling food. And so we're, we're doing this using a range of biometrics equipment, which we've recently purchased in our, our market research lab, which we're quite excited about. Um, we've got eye trackers and, and facial recognition software and so forth. So we're actually asking people to come into the lab to look at these upcycled um, food, you know, stimuli, package stimuli and, and look at how they're responding to different cues um, around social environment, um, nutrition, et cetera. Look, as upcycling becomes 
you know, more accepted. I think the next focus is obviously going to be on scaling up processes and building a really good um, secure infrastructure in New Zealand. And I'm not underestimating that challenge. Um, KPMG highlighted some of the challenges in their report last year in their agribusiness report. Um, you know, they say there's a lack of innovative businesses looking to create new markets. It's expensive in New Zealand to set up these sorts of businesses. Scaling up is challenging. Regulation can be stifling, um, et cetera. And just as a, a case in point, I don't know if you remember or, or heard of Green Spot Technology. They were a Brazilian uh, duo living in New Zealand. Uh, they were academics who turned into sort of entrepreneurs as, throughout their sort of research. Um, and, and they were creating a, it's really the world's first range of low calorie fermented flowers uh, from byproducts from the fruit and, and vegetable industry. Um, and, and we lost them, New Zealand lost them to, to France uh, because of that lack of uh, investment that, that you know, they weren't able to secure the investment they needed to take their research, to take their product to that, to that next level. Um, and they've gone on and won all sorts of awards in France and are you know, doing really well for themselves. So just a, a case in point in you know, getting something like this uh, going in New Zealand. This is my last slide. Um, I, you know, I really are expecting, you know, this year, next year to be the year that upcycled products take off here in, in Aotearoa. Um, I guess we here at, at Food Waste Innovations um, research team are really excited to be providing the, the cutting edge research to, to, you know, to require to help make this happen. And you know, if we are going to tap these new opportunities, there really is something for everybody to do. Uh, government, we need support, we need support from government for the sector. It's really at its introductory level, like I've mentioned, uh, manufacturers, um, you know, need uh, are going to need things like uh, co-funding uh, support um, to help, you know, to help kickstart investment in this space. We need retailers to stock these products, you know, take that, so take that gamble and, and stock these products to educate consumers, maybe consider soft launches in store, uh, you know, familiarize, help familiarize consumers with uh, convince consumers, I guess, that these products can taste just as good as, as a, a, a new product or a, a, you know, a product not made from waste. Um, we need, um, we need, we need, obviously, manufacturers can work towards certification for these products, um, help with that awareness of raising I've just mentioned, um, help develop trust and, and understanding in consumers, um, you know, in, in upcycling and the process of upcycling and, you know, providing transparency for ing ingredient disclosure and those sorts of things I've mentioned will help with that. We need researchers focusing on testing acceptance of real upcycled food products in supermarket uh, environments to gain, you know, deeper insights into consumer behaviour rather than hypothetical perceptions. And, you know, I guess most importantly, once these products appear on shelf, we need consumers to vote with their wallets and, and buy them. Um, and, with that, I'm going to, to leave it uh, and happy to take any questions. I apologize, I haven't left a lot of time, uh, but I have got some contact details there for you. Like I said, always happy to have a coffee and talk waste. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Miranda. That was um, a really, uh, really insightful, comprehensive talk kind of going across from kind of pure and applied science um, into social science and uh, and you know out of uh, out beyond academia into the real world too. So it was really great to to hear about that range of of work. Um, we do have a bit of time for questions now. If um, anyone would like to unmute themselves and put them on themselves on video and um, and, and shout out. Oh, and I see Ray's put a, a link to the startup um, audacious in the chat as well. If anyone's interested in in having a look at that, thanks, Ray. Well, um, I might uh, kick off then in, in the absence of anyone else, oh, unless that was you, Ray, about to... Uh, I guess I've, I've got one question, and I, I guess from my position in operations, my question mm -hmm. is, um, I know that there's close connections between uh, food science and human nutrition, mm -hmm. looking at, at this. But what's the involvement across the breadth of all of the disciplines and how, how does it link in 
across the many disciplines and, and expertise that we have across the university? Yeah, cool. Um, good question, right? We've got, uh, I think, about 24 primary investigators and, and about 15 postgrad students uh, who are based at the University of Otago, sort of so with, with, with the theme. Um, and they, we do have researchers from commerce, obviously, um, number of colleagues in, in the marketing department, uh, but, but also elsewhere, accountancy and finance, we've got um, economics, we've got uh, colleagues, sociologists, so sort of from the humanities that are looking at, you know, systemic issues to do with, with waste. Uh, we've got, uh, obviously, a um, number of, of, of colleagues as well from the sciences. So, I mean, food waste is, it's a complex problem, right? And, and it really is a multidisciplinary um, problem that requires researchers working across the across the different you know sub disciplines to to come together and you know, come up with a creative solution. So that's I guess that's what we're trying to reflect with our um, with our research theme. In fact, it was the whole reason for the research theme was to break down some of those um, some of those barriers and, and get people talking and and working together. Um, you know, if you just look at something like. Oh, you know, packaging, for example, and, and looking at it um, in, in terms of food waste, you know, we, we need to understand uh, the sort of the benefits and, 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 of, of, and, and the pros and cons of, of packaging uh, food in terms of, you know, extension of shelf life. And, and so that requires our sort of researchers working in that measurement space, understanding those metrics. We need to um, consider different alternatives for packaging food uh, using, you know, can we use raw materials, waste, can we, you know, up, uh, waste streams and, and use those in, in some sort of functional packaging. I see Indra, Indra is online, she's a, a colleague of food science, you know, looking at innovative packaging solutions is something she does. If we are going to be looking at these innovative packaging solutions, we need consumers to accept them. And so we've had, you know, we've got researchers that are looking at, um, consumer acceptance of innovative packaging solutions and what's going to fly and, and what's not and so you know just a, we really need that breadth of expertise to to tackle a, a simple issue like you know, packaging our food wow yeah it does sound like there's a lot involved in there you you talked a bit about um like comparisons with different countries, you know, and whether it's easy or difficult to get these systems set up in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Is there any country that's kind of really got a good good way in, in progressing this that, that kind of we can look to as a role model? Yeah, I mean, America is where the large largest proportion of upcycled activity is, has happened to date. Um, and I guess broadening, yeah, so, so there is, uh, yeah, there is a an obvious sort of case study in terms of how we could can, could approach this um, the available for us. And I guess just sort of, sort of broadening it out a little bit, you know, New Zealand is lagging behind almost everywhere else in the world when it comes to tackling food waste uh, at sort of a national scale. Uh, and, and, you know, we even in New Zealand, we, we are yet to set a national target. In fact, we're yet to even define food waste. We're currently being commissioned by the Ministry of Environment to, to put together a food waste definition. Um, we're yet to, like I said, adopt targets. Um, we have, hot, you know, we have some activities happening, food waste prevention activities happening, like I said, but you know, there's not a lot of coordination, there's not a lot of uh, resourcing of these activities. So, um, there's definitely not a, a national strategy on this issue. You know, these are these are things that have, we're seeing um, elsewhere. Uh, you know, in some cases they've been set 20 years ago. Um, you know, Australia. We look across the ditch. Australia has just put 120 million uh, into a 10-year food waste uh, research cooperative cooperative research centre. Um, you know, that's the level of investment that's going into this into this issue. Um, and yeah, so, so we've still got lots of lots of progress to, to make here in New Zealand, but the wheels are moving. I've, I, I didn't mention, I should have mentioned um, the Prime Minister's uh, Chief Science Advisor's office this year is looking at uh, food waste. They, each year their office 
sort of picks a project, picks a, a topic. I think they looked at antimicrobial resistance last year. The year before that, it was plastics packaging. This year, it's food waste. So there will be, um, there's a big consultative sort of process looking at, you know, what are we doing in New Zealand in this, in this area? What needs to be done? Um, and a series of recommendations will come out of that process, which should get some, you know, some traction uh, because, you know, I guess this has been um, requested by the Prime Minister. Um, so, so hopeful that, you know, the wheels are moving, I'd like them to move faster, um, but <laughs> heading in the right direction. Yeah, those wheels always move too slowly. Yeah, <laughs> do they ever? Yeah. Um, are, there, are there any other questions from, from anyone else on the call? Do your kids have any questions? <laughs> Do you eat all your food? Yeah. <laughs> kids are the worst. They're all, when we look at different yeah. different segments of who's wasting food, kids are, you know, through the, the fussy, fussy yeah. eating are generally the worst culprits. It's an ongoing battle. <laughs> um, well, okay then. I think bearing in mind the time, um, I think we might leave it there. Um, but th thanks again for your time. Today, Miranda, it was a really fascinating talk, um, and all the best with the uh, with moving that work forwards. Oh, try out our uh, try out the beer recipe if you're if you're so inclined. It, it's yeah, good. yeah, More definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.